Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Everybody there? Yes. Let's read. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so we also share, or so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, you ever wonder why you get to those moments yeah. where you're distressed? Yeah. <laughs> if we are distressed, it is for your comfort. And salvation, just wrap your head around that for a minute. Bless. If you didn't go through times of stress, then you wouldn't make it to heaven. Oh, wow. He says you need times 
where you need to be comforted and times where you go through distress so that you can be comforted in times where you can actually find salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm. Because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia or in Detroit or wherever you are. <laughs> we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. So that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Come on, bro. But this happened. So God, why do I feel so much pressure right now? Well, this happened so that you wouldn't rely on yourself, but on God who raises the dead. Come on. Point number one. Under great pressure. Paul writes here, he says, I was under great, or he says, we were under great pressure. You ever gone through times in your life where that's how you would describe it? Oh, okay. Great pressure. I can't even handle it type of pressure. Well, this is the kind of pressure Paul describes here. He says, I was under great pressure, far beyond my ability to endure. Great. And Paul, we know that he was he was feeling pressure from persecution. Literally, he was being chased from city to city. He was being stoned and dragged or out of cities for preaching the word. He also had this great pressure that he carried in his concern for all the churches. And all the churches that had been planted, he had this great pressure to make sure that everybody was taken care of. He had this great pressure that he carried to raise up the Timothys and the Silases and the Tituses, the next, the next group of leaders that he was raising up. And it was something that he carried with him every day. Pressure. You know, pressure is an interesting thing. Pressure is a, it's a compelling force. You know, today, uh, Noelle, she came into our house. I think she uh, just had her quiet time. And, uh, you know, I shared with her. She had already heard, but I shared with Noah. I said, you know, did you hear the news? <laughs> Maya had a baby today, and she didn't even make it to the hospital. She had the baby, like, on the bathroom floor. And Summer delivered the baby. Can you even imagine? And her first question was, where, where was Nana? <laughs> and I just thought, I thought, Nana, Nana? In all honesty, Nana was probably running around, oh, Lord, please, please help me. This is like a pressure that was far beyond his ability to endure. He's like, God, please help me. You know, he, I already not even know what Nana was doing. But I know that Maya was getting, having a baby and Summer was delivering it. Wow. And I know that Shanice was, was helping everybody, uh, uh, helping us, you know, getting all the info out and doing whatever she was doing. It was just a crazy sight, I'm sure. But you think about pressure. You know, most people have a great aversion to feeling pressure. Yes. Like pressure is a bad thing. So, so many people avoid it at all costs like they avoid the plague. Yes. But I want to tell you something. And listen to me right now. Pressure is your friend. Pressure is your friend. Why? Well, look what Paul says. He says, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. And he says, this happened, the middle of verse 9, this happened so that we wouldn't rely on ourselves, but on God. In other words, why do we go through great pressure? So that you would pray. Because if you didn't go through great pressure, you would be so prideful, and I would be so prideful, we would never get on our knees and pray. We wouldn't seek God. And Paul says, this happened so that we wouldn't get self-reliant, but that we would pray. No, pressure, it's great. Pressure is your friend. Because it leads you 
and it compels you to rely on God and to seek him and to not be self-reliant. God has designed pressure. That's one of God's designs. In his wisdom, God knows that you and I need pressure because it pushes us towards prayer. You know, when you think about pressure as it relates to mechanics or as it relates to the human body, even, you need pressure. Let's talk about heart pressure. You need a certain amount of heart pressure. Now, it can't be too high. You have a heart attack. But also, your pressure can't be too low. You're going to die if it's too low as well. You need pressure at just the right amount. If you think about your car, oil pressure. Right? You need oil pressure, the same thing, at just the right amount. If it's too high, you're going to blow a gasket. Gasket, you're going to blow your engine. And too, too low, your car's not going to run. You need pressure. The same thing for you. You need pressure in just the right amount so that you will pray. And here's the thing. You think you know what your amount is. <laughs> <laughs> you think you know. No, you don't know. God knows the amount of pressure you need to get you to pray. And he will apply it in the amount that you need so that you will seek him. Paul thought he knew what he could endure. Paul says, oh, it was so much pressure. It was far beyond my ability to endure. Was that true? No. <laughs> he endured it. <laughs> he didn't die. He didn't blow a gasket. He survived it. It certainly made him pray, but he survived it. He thought it was too much. Right. He thought that, that God had put on him too, just too much, God, but it was just the right amount. What you think is too high is just the right amount of pressure <laughs> that you need so that you will pray and so that you will seek God. Now, pressure can be higher for some than others. I believe God applies to each of us what we need. And I've also seen this in my own life, that God applies the level of pressure in accordance with my level of pride. <laughs> you guys hear what I say? God applies the level of pressure in accordance with my level of pride, specifically in the area of prayer. In other words, the, the less I pray, the less I'm seeking God, the, the, the more I'm putting him up and trying to fix things on my own, then God ups the pressure in my life because he's going to motivate me because God wants more than anything for you and I to seek him and pressure is how he accomplishes that so don't be afraid of pressure it's your friend just be humble and be God reliant and not self-reliant pressure is also transforming you look at nature okay you look at the process of making a diamond how do you make a diamond? Well, it starts with, starts with a lump of coal, and you apply a lot of heat and pressure, and over millions of years, it forms a diamond. Wow. It's the same thing with you. How does God transform you? With a lot of heat and a lot of pressure. And then he transforms you into something very beautiful, a diamond. In fact, our character is revealed when pressure is applied. Yeah. You want to know what's inside? Then squeeze it. <laughs> think about it. I mean, it's not funny. Until, it's funny until it's happening to you, right? But think, if you squeeze an orange, you squeeze it hard enough, you're going to see what's inside of that orange. Pressure, it, it, it really, you know, God's going to apply pressure, and that's what you're going to see what's really going on on the inside of you. It allows you to see by what comes out. You know, and you think about pressure, too. It's also something that's within. Pressure comes from within because it's what you feel on the inside in response to what you're going through. Affliction. Pressure comes from within, so you must learn to master it. 
within. There's only one way to deal with pressure. One way. And it's very simple. Pray. But so often, it's so simple yet it's so confusing yeah. to many. <laughs> that's the one thing God will provide in your life to get you to pray. And that's what God wants more than anything. So that you will pray and seek him. Without prayer, you will never see the way. Without pressure, you would never pray. And without prayer, you will never see the direction that God wants you to go in. In 2 Kings chapter 6, when afflicted by the army of Aram, Elijah's servant wakes up in the morning. And he goes out and he sees this army surrounding them. And he freaks out. It was this pressure far beyond his ability to endure. And what does Elisha do? Elisha prays. He says, God, open his eyes so that he can see. See, when you pray, God applies pressure to get you to pray. And when you pray, then you begin to see what God wants you to see. You begin to go in the direction that God wants you to go in. I know for us, okay, we got here. And I don't know why housing has been so difficult for us. Right? <laughs> like every city we go to is like difficult to get into housing. It's a pressure that I thought far beyond my ability to endure. Amen. But God must know that I can endure it because he allows me to go through it every place we go. <laughs> so we get here. At first we thought, okay, we're going to buy a house. Okay. And then we couldn't sell the house that we were trying to sell in Oregon. So we just decided to rent it out. We just concluded, okay, God doesn't want us to buy a house here. So we'll just rent. So we got into a home and we started renting and rent was pretty high. And, and we thought, okay, everything is good. Well, then, you know, the we landlord, that. you know, started going after us. And the <laughs> landlord started saying, hey, you guys have too many dogs. You guys got too many women, uh, too many girls that are staying at your house. We were trying to take care of the sisters until they got into their apartment. And she's like, you got to kick them out tomorrow. And then she's like, you know, and by the way, the neighbors complained you had a church service. Um, your house is a place of residence, not a business. You can't have church there. And I'm like, what in the world? What that introduced to my life is a thing called pressure. And she's like, I'm going to kick you out if you do these things. Pressure. Far beyond my ability to endure. So I thought, well, it made me pray. God, what are you doing? What do you want us to see here? What direction? Well, God put it on my heart to go try to see if we would get uh, uh, if we could just buy a house, okay? So we go and we 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 apply, we get approved. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Now we're gonna buy a house. We're in contract, supposed to close in like three weeks. And now we can have church there. Yeah. We can bring everybody over. All the sisters can stay. Hey, you know, like, <laughs> and no one's gonna say anything, okay? Because it's our house. But I never would have done that. I never would I never would have done that if I didn't go through that pressure. Right. I never would have prayed. I just stayed in comfort land in that house and thought everything was okay. And I would probably and I would have wasted a lot more money and I would have given all my money to the landlord versus now I'm gonna have a house that God's gonna help us yes. do this financially do. Yeah. But I've got to deal with the inconvenience of packing my boxes again. I gotta move again. That's very uncomfortable. But it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. The path to being comforted, you're usually very uncomfortable along the way. You understand what I'm saying there? The path to finding comfort is often uncomfortable because you have to go through affliction. You have to go through struggle. You have to go through pain. But at the end, God is going to comfort you. Which leads us to our second point. Abundant comfort. Now, who doesn't want that? I want abundant comfort. Comfort. That scripture says, just as you go through abundant suffering, well, I got good news. You're going to go through abundant comfort yeah. as well. Second so Corinthians one three. He says, "Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion." Now, how many of us really view God that way? The Father of compassion. Passion, the God of all comfort. I think often we look at God in, in a different way. I think He's, I think we look at Him wrongly as the Father of just discipline, the Father who's disappointed in me. 
the father who doesn't like me that much, or I'm just the kid he puts up with. No, it says he's the father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. I love this scripture because it says that, that God is the God of all comfort. So all the comfort that you need, right? Just as God applies all the pressure you need. Well, he also applies all the, or gives all the comfort that you need. Some of us need more comfort. God is the God of all comfort. And there's not a situation where he cannot provide comfort in that situation. He's the God of all comfort. So no matter what you're going through, it doesn't matter the affliction that you're facing. It doesn't matter the pressure. God knows how to comfort you in that moment specifically that you're going through. Times, what are some of the situations where we need to be comforted? And I just thought about this for my own life. Times of affliction is a time where you need to be comforted. The scripture that you can just write down, Isaiah 49, 13. The Bible says, sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on the afflicted. So a moment where you need great comfort is when you're going through great affliction. Well, what is affliction? Affliction is defined as something that causes you pain or sorrow. The origin of the origin of the word affliction actually means to be struck. So it's as if you're getting hit. You're taking hits. You ever felt pummeled by life? That's a time of affliction. God says when you're going through affliction, that's a time to come to me. I'm going to comfort you. That affliction might be job related, finance rate related, relationship related. It can come in many forms, but God will comfort you in those moments. God comforts us during times of mourning as well. Isaiah or Matthew 5 verse 4 says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Maybe you're going through and mourning the loss of someone. We've seen some loss this week with our dear friend April Baker. God wants to comfort you in times of mourning. The death of someone that is close, or any time where you're going through deep sadness, times of mourning. God wants to comfort the brokenhearted, Psalm 34, 18. The Bible says the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. So there's many situations, and I don't know what you're going through right now. Maybe you can relate to one of those three, but maybe there's something else that you're going through. The point of all this is that there's nothing that you can go through where God can't comfort you. The question is, will you go to him? Will you seek him? Or will you continue to run from him? I love Isaiah 66, 13. Just write that down. And this, uh, this uh, scripture is even more powerful today in thinking about Maya delivering her new baby boy. Isaiah 66, 13 says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You know, God tells us that the way that he will comfort us is like a mother with a child. Often I say, you know, if you want to understand God or what helps me understand God is think like a dad. But when it comes to comfort, God says, I want you to think like a mom. <laughs> In the area of comfort, I want you to think like a mother. Because as a mother comforts her little child, that's how I'm going to comfort you. You know, when I needed comfort as a kid, I never went to dad. <laughs> I went to my mom. My dad didn't have the patience. My mom would, would literally, if I had these really, really bad growing pains growing up. And, my, and I'd go to my mom, I'd be crying. My legs would be in so much pain. And she would sit there and just rub my legs for hours. She'd be falling asleep practically, and she'd still be rubbing my legs. Are you okay? And she she just sit there for until the wee hours of the morning, making sure that I was taking, making sure that I wasn't feeling any pain. That's the comfort of a mother. My dad, no way. 
<laughs> my dad, like his most common phrase was, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> Moms don't typically say, now if mom says that to you, then you probably really need to suck it up. Right. But for dads, it's like the standby phrase. My finger like twisted, bent out of shape. My dad, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> but not your mom. Mothers have a heart that's inclined to comfort their child. And this is the heart of God. This is what God wants. He wants to comfort you. He's patient. He'll take the time that's needed. He'll stay with you all night long. He wants to comfort you like a mother comforts the child. But the question is, will you go to him? Turn to Isaiah chapter 30. Will you go to him? Will you go to God until you get the comfort that you need? Or will you go to something else? Or will you just go to people? Sometimes we just go to people and we try to get all the comfort from people. That makes you very people reliant, but not God reliant. Sometimes we go to sin. That makes you very sin reliant, which will always leave you hanging and not God reliant. Sometimes we just refuse to be comforted. In Isaiah 30, verse 15, the Bible says, this is what the sovereign Lord says, the Holy One of Israel. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But, but you would have none of it. He said, no, I don't want any rest. I don't want any comfort. I don't want salvation. I don't want no quietness and trust. I don't want none of that. It says you will flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. You said we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all run away. Till you're left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. What is that saying? He says you're going to be very lonely. The person that always runs from God, that always runs from God's comfort, he says you're going to be like a banner on a hill by yourself, no one around, refusing to be comforted and sad. Verse 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise to show you compassion. For the Lord is God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Comfort doesn't always come in our time either. He says, blessed, happy is all who wait for him. God provides comfort in his time. You got to go to God and keep going to God until you get that comfort. He says, he'll give you rest. He'll strengthen you. But he says, the heart of the person here, he said, they said they would have none of it. They got on a horse and they took off. They ran. So the point is, for us, sometimes we run from God. God wants to comfort us, but we will not have any of it because we don't pray. We're too prideful to pray. We're too prideful to get on these. And we try to go to other things. You know, yesterday, I was praying over here by the lake. And I love to come here. I come here every day. And sometimes I walk for seven miles. I pray and I make calls. I pray some more. But this is my favorite place to pray. And I was over here praying and there's ducks. You guys know there's ducks everywhere. There's geese everywhere. And God gave me a great illustration yesterday because I was praying. And as I was, just, I was praying, this duck walked across my path. And the duck had a, 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 a bobber that it was dragging and fishing line. And I looked closer and there was a hook inside of the duck. And the duck is, I, I, you know, I, I try to catch it, you know, and I, and I, and I stepped on the, uh, on the fishing line and it jerked the duck and I grabbed the fishing line. I tried to help the duck and the duck just, I, I didn't quite grab it and it got in and it swam away. And every time, you know, I saw it again, I grabbed that, I grabbed that fishing line again and I tried to pull the duck and the duck was ticked off at me. And I'm like, duck, <laughs> I'm just trying to help you right now. <laughs> Just let me take the hook out. I'm trying to comfort you. And, and, and the duck, you know, I'm sitting there trying to pull it close to me so I can take the hook out. And the duck doesn't understand. And it's hissing at me. I'm like, just settle down. Just calm down. I'm going to help you right now. This lady comes over and she's holding the duck, you know, and she like holds its face over this way. And I'm, I'm like, it's going to hurt a little bit, you know, because that hook was in there. And I got, I pulled that hook out. And then that duck just calmed down. Wow. Let it go and it 
takes off, it swims away. <laughs> and I thought about that, you know, that duck refused to be comforted <laughs> because it, it didn't know what I was doing. It just wanted to run away from me. It was hissing at me because it didn't trust me. Stuff doesn't work like that with God. Yeah. We run, we, we take off, and, and we think that we think that God's just gonna clobber us. <laughs> the duck had no idea what I was gonna do. I was trying to help it. But we're like that duck, we run away. And we don't pray, we just rely on ourselves, we refuse to be comforted. Sometimes we turn to sin. In Job 36, 21, just write that down. Job 36, 21. The Bible says, Beware of turning to sin, which you seem to prefer to affliction. So the scripture says here that sometimes in times of affliction that we want to turn to sin. He says, beware of doing this. Beware of turning to sin, which you seem to prefer to affliction, because sin is like temporary comfort. Sin is an escape. Yeah. We're running from God. We turn to sin thinking that's going to comfort us, whether it be drinking or whether that be impurity. We turn to these things. Sometimes it's things that aren't necessarily sin, but they can become that entertainment, just sitting around watching movies, eating, those kinds of things. If we're turning those to those things when we should be turning to God, but we're running from him and turning to these false gods, he says, beware of that. Because you can get to where you prefer that over times of affliction. That's crazy. What our heart should be is where we prefer affliction over our sin. Can you get, like, I put up with affliction, but to get to a place where I prefer affliction? Oh, wow. And that's where we got to get, where we prefer affliction more than sin because we have a conviction that sin does more damage than affliction. Yeah. Turn to Luke chapter 6. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. In Luke chapter 6, verse 24. Let's look at another scripture. Preach, bro. Come on, bro. Don't run from God. Don't run from pressure. Let it draw, let it help you draw near to him. In Luke 6, 24, I love the scripture. It says in verse 20, actually. Luke 6, 20. It says, looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor. So, how many campus students can relate to that? <laughs> <laughs> Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now. How many campus students can relate to that? <laughs> for you will be satisfied. <laughs> Blessed are you who weep, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you. And they insult you and they reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Oh. That's a very hard scripture. Yeah. And God says, Bless, when you're going through stuff, when you're poor, when you're hungry, when everyone's persecuting, he says, you're blessed. Get fired up about that. No. <laughs> because what you have in store for you is the kingdom of God. Yes. In comfort from me. But he says here, he says... He says, but if you're rich now, and you're feeding yourself now, and you're relying on the praises of man now, he says, that's all the comfort you're going to get. <laughs> so the point of that is when, when we try to find our comfort in the world, when we go to people for, when we go to the, the praises of the world for our comfort, when we go to money for our comfort, when we go to any worldly thing for our comfort, God says, well, Better enjoy it because that's all the comfort you're going to get. It's just what the world has to offer. And it's a temporary and false comfort. And it's not a fulfilling comfort. It's temporary. God says, come to me and I'll give you all comfort. I'm the God of all comfort. And the lesson is only the comfort 
from God will bring you peace. Come on, brother. Only the comfort that comes from God will fulfill you. So how do we find that comfort? Turn to Psalm 23. Come on. How do we find that comfort? In Psalm 23, verse 1, the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. <laughs> the Lord makes me lie down. You're going to make you lie down? Yeah. <laughs> the Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the Bible says here that what comforts you is the rod and the staff. You ever think about that? Now, <laughs> if you just, at first five, it doesn't seem very comforting. And that's because your view of God is, is more like a club. It's like your view is God's going to club you <laughs> as soon as you get out of step. But the rod and staff were never used to beat the sheep. <laughs> God didn't beat the sheep, or the shepherd, the good shepherds did not beat their sheep with the rod and with the staff. That's not what they're used for. The rod and staff was used to guide the sheep, yeah. to help the sheep, and to protect the sheep. That's what the rod and staff was used for. Literally to protect, to ward off animals and to lead, gently lead and guide the sheep. So you think about, you think about for us, what is our guide? What is our protection? It's what's right in front of you. It's the word of God. That's your rod and staff. The word of God is what keeps you from going astray. The word of God is your protection. The word of God is your guide. The word of God is what leads you. Where do you find comfort? In the word of God. That's the answer. The answer to overcoming pressure, the answer to finding comfort is to get on our knees and pray and to get into God's word. It will, it's as simple that it will never change. God will never change. That's what he desires for you to do. Seek him with all of your heart. How? You get in your Bible. You read until you find comfort. You pray. Until you overcome the anxiety and the pressure that you feel. And God will provide it for you. But you have to fight for it. You know, go back to my story about the duck. This duck was running from me. He refused to be comforted from me. And I thought, you know, if I could just, if I could just talk to the duck. The duck doesn't, I don't speak duck. <laughs> but if the duck can understand my word, I would say duck. I want to help you right now. And maybe the duck would listen, you know. But my voice was foreign to the duck. I was, I was talking to the duck. I'm like, duck, just settle down. You know, the duck didn't hear me. The duck did, could hear me, but didn't understand me. My voice was foreign to the duck. And that gave me another, another insight. Because the duck kept running away from my voice, and it stayed in pain. What's the lesson? If the word of God is foreign to you, you will never be comforted. Yeah. If the word of God is foreign to you, you will never be comforted. Wow. So we go to God, we get the comfort from him, and then it says, then you can give it to each other. Amen. So we can get comfort from one another. He says, he says, he says, comfort those with the comfort that you have received from God. So the most spiritual people are the best comforters. The most unspiritual people are the worst comforters. Wow. Because they don't go to God for their comfort. So they can't teach you how to get comfort Woo. from God. Woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> See, guys, we, we are those that God has called us. This is a great, you want to talk about pressure. This is a great godly pressure that I feel every day. It's the pressure to bring comfort to a hurting world. Yeah. The pressure to share my faith. The pressure to study the Bible with people. The pressure to evangelize this world. Why? Because that's how we provide comfort to a hurting world. And that's how we provide comfort to one another. By sharing the scriptures with each other. By being in each other's lives. 
With the comfort we get from God, we give to one another and we give to a hurting world. My last point. Let's go. An anchor for your soul. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Come on, bro. Let's go back and finish it up. An anchor for your soul. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. You guys with me? In verse 9, it says, it says, indeed, we felt that we have received, that we have received a sentence of death. But this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. God has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he'll deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. You know, this section that we read today of 2 Corinthians, it concludes with this thought, that you have to set your hope. And that word set means to cement it. It means to set your hope that God will always deliver you. Wow. And that's what you have to, you have to set that in your mind and you have to believe that. That no matter what you go through, no matter what affliction that you go through, no matter what pressure or amount of pressure that you go through, God will always deliver you. He says you got to set your hope on God's deliverance. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Bye, bro. Hope is an anchor for your soul. <clears throat> what keeps you cemented? What keeps you set? Hope. Hope in God's deliverance. Hope in God's promises. So he says, as you go through these times of affliction, as you go through these great times of pressure, when you think it's more than you can bear, you have to have your hope set on God's promises. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17, the Bible says, Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. You know, the Bible says here that God's, the promises of God are meant to be an anchor for your soul. How many promises of God do you rely on? How many promises of God do you know? How many can you just tell me right now, this is a promise of God? It's a great Bible study. How do I get through hard times? How do I most of the time stay unwavering in my faith? How do I go through great times of great pressure? Now, my wife would probably say, oh, you don't always. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> she knows. She, on, she's the one who sees when I'm coming apart. But, but my point is, how do you? How do you, how do I go through it? Well, for me, I rely on God's promises. Amen. This is for real. Yeah. There's promises, guys, that as I'm praying, I just recount them in my mind over and over again. One of them, Matthew 28, 20. God will never leave us. He says, I am with you always as you go about making disciples of all nations. <laughs> Another promise that I always rely on when it's difficult and the ministry is gritty is Matthew 9 35 the harvest is always plentiful that's a promise of God that the harvest is always plentiful so no matter how many people tell me no no matter how many people walk away from the Bible studies I go back to that promise you know what the Bible says the harvest is always plentiful I need to keep sharing Romans 8 35 to 39 nothing can separate us from the love of God no, not hardship, not demons, nothing can separate you from God's love. How about Matthew 6, 33? The promise that God will meet every need if you seek him with all of your heart. The promise that God will meet every need if you seek him with all of your heart. And how about Romans 8, 28? This one, I, 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 I've recounted this one probably 20 times this year already. 
God is always working for the good of those who love him. When I, when, when I can't, when I'm going through housing difficulty, when I'm getting almost kicked out of one house and have to find another, I'm like, what are we going to do? You know what I think? That scripture. God is always working for my good. Because I love him. I, I have to tell myself that scripture over and over again. I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Remember God's promises and believe God's promises. And lastly, the promise of salvation. Matthew 24, 13. The Bible says the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Let's go. The one who stands firm <laughs> to the end will be saved. You know what? Never forget that. Never forget about heaven. How often do you think about heaven? Turn to Revelation chapter 21. <laughs> Go to Revelation 20, our final scripture. How often do you think about heaven? You know, people that walk away from the faith, they, they forgot. Yeah. They forgot about what is in store for them. The world is more beautiful to them than heaven itself. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, the Bible says, God will wipe away. This is, this is heaven, okay? He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And death will be no more. And neither will there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. How about relying as an anchor for your soul the promise of eternal comfort? Right. <laughs> he says when you get to heaven... That he will wipe away your tear and it'll be the last tear that you ever shed. He says you'll never have to experience death. There will never be any times of mourning or crying. And you won't experience pain anymore. There'll, you'll never have times of pressure. You'll never have times where you say this is too much. You'll never have a moment where you have to go through pain. There'll be no more affliction. He says, that's a thing of the past. All you have now is eternal comfort. So remember that. The greatest of all promises. When you're under great pressure and you think this is far beyond my ability to endure. And when you're in need of great comfort, go to God. Pray to see with his eyes. Listen to his voice through the word of God. And persevere to the very end until the day he wipes away our tears and we're all in heaven together. And to God be the glory. Wow.